I hope you all brought your thinking caps because it is time for HTM School. Hi, I'm Matt Taylor of Numenta. Welcome to episode one of HTM School, where we are going to talk about bit arrays. Yes, bit arrays. So this is the most basic of basics when it comes to HTM theory. This is a precursor to some SDR episodes that are coming up, but I wanna go over some of the most basic functions of bit array so you'll be familiar with them. If you're a computer scientist or a computer engineer, you have some experience, you could probably just skip this episode if you are familiar with bit arrays and binary operations and things like that. But there are maybe some tasty nuggets at the end where we talk specifically about some sparse representations that can fit into bit arrays. So here we go. Here is a bit array. Eight bits. Uh, so this is an eight bit array. You can tell because it has eight things in it. The things are bits. A bit can be one or zero. That means on or off, positive or negative. And that's basically all a bit is. Two values, on or off. And this bit array has eight of them. So how can we tell what the capacity of this is? How many different values can this bit array represent? Well, that's somewhat simple because we know each bit can represent two values and there are eight of them. So we can multiply them all together. Two times two times two times two times two times two times two, times two, two, two which is 256. You might notice we could write this as two to the eighth power. So two times two, eight times, because there are eight elements in the array, each one can have two values. That's how math works. Also, if you know the length of your array, you know the capacity of your array, because you can just take two to the power of the length of the array. That is the array capacity. So let's talk about binary. Binary is a way to encode integer numbers within bit arrays. You can either start on the right or on the left, and we're gonna start on the right-hand side and work our way to the left. As you can see here, each position in the bit array is going to represent a different power of two. And if the bit is on, we're going to add that number to the accumulating number that we're building. So in this case, with all of the numbers that are on, all of the place positions that are on, we're gonna take those numbers that those represent and add them together and this adds up to 109. So this bit array of 01101101 is 109. If we were to take one of those bits and flip it, make it the opposite, in this case we'll take this zero and we'll make it a one, it completely changes the value of this binary representation from 109 to 125 because it adds 16 to it. So it's this, bit array does not have any real semantic value to these positions, except that they are just accumulating, you know, doubling as we move from one side to the other. Let's talk about ASCII real quick. Uh, ASCII is a character format that can be represented in eight bits. So eight bits me can represent a character. Like in this case, this is the character lowercase m, 01101101, lowercase m just because the people who created the ASCII standard decided that would represent M. It doesn't necessarily mean that any of those bits mean anything. If I were to take a bit inside of the M value and switch it to the opposite bit, and it becomes something completely different, has no relation to M at all, it's not even a letter. So that tells us that this representation, this ASCII representation that's encoded into this bit array has no semantic value, meaning those positions in that bit array really don't represent anything. It's just random, somebody decided that if this string of bits were, was in this, this position, that would mean M or that would mean X or whatever. So no semantic value in this. Let's talk about a few basic binary operations real quick. So we'll start with an OR. So if we have two bit arrays and we want to take the OR of them, we would just take each place position and if either one of them is positive or one, then that results in a positive value. So in this case, we get a bit array with a bunch of ones at the bottom because most of the bits of the two values that we're ORing have at least one in each place value. So there's only one that results in a zero because both of them were zero. 
So when you OR two values together, you're typically going to get a, a new bit array with more ones in it. Let's talk about AND, another very basic binary operation. Very similar to OR, except we're not saying if this value or this value is positive, then the result is positive. Both of them must be positive, very simple. So in this case, we get a binary array with just three on bits in it because only those place positions had both ones in it in the two numbers we were anding together. So we get a result with potentially less ones than the two that we anded together. There's another type of OR called the XOR or the exclusive OR. Very simple actually. Whereas in the first OR, we would make the resulting value one if one or the other or both happen to be positive. The exclusive OR says not both, only one or the other, only one of them can be a positive value and then the result will be a positive value. So in this case, we get several less one values than we did when we OR them together uh, because any of them that have m both positive values will turn into a negative value. So that is the exclusive OR or XOR. A NOT is extremely simple. It's an inverse, essentially. So you're just taking every place value. We're not comparing it to another bit array. We're just saying, if it's a zero, make it a one. If it's a one, make it a zero. And you essentially get the inverse of that bit array. So when we talk about population, all that means is how many positive values are in the bit array. In this case, five. There are five ones in this bit array, and that is the population. You will sometimes see this referred to as the Hamming weight, which is essentially the same thing when we're talking about a binary array. The Hamming weight is actually the number of symbols in the representation that are non-zero, but when we're talking about a bit array, it's the same thing as the number of things that are one. So let's talk about a bigger array. 256 bits. Is that me? <laughs> so we have a 256 bit array here. And let's talk about the capacity of this. So our eight bit array had, it could contain 256 values, right? So now we've got an array with 256 places in it. Its capacity is gonna be huge. Remember, it's two to the power of the length of the array, so two to the 256th power, which is one with 77 zeros after it. This is a very large number. It's not quite the amount of atoms in the observable universe, but we're getting up there. So you can contain a lot of different data representations in a simple 256-bit array. So sparsity versus density. I would consider this a dense array. If you look at it, it's about 50% on, 50% off. Typically in HTM speak, we talk about dense arrays at a much lower density than that. When we talk about sparsity, we're usually talking about 2%. So 50% is very dense. If you look at a truly sparse array like this one, only four bits are on, that's 2% of 256. It looks a lot different and its capacity is a lot different too, much, much, much less. That just means if we're going to keep the sparsity of this array down to 2% and only have four bits on, there's a lot fewer different representations that we can store in it. In this case, it's about 175 million. So we could store four on bits in this array in about 175 million ways. And we'll talk about the math of this when we start talking about sparse distributed representations in future episodes. But to squeak into the SDR realm, let's talk about this sparse array as a way of representing features. So we could say that these four bits that are on might represent features of a population of people, for example. This bit might mean that the person representing is a musician. This bit might mean their gender is female. Another bit could mean that they're currently alive. And another could mean that they're African American. So if we had a representation like this, this could represent several different people, like Beyonce, Macy Gray, Aretha Franklin. 
but it would not represent someone like Whitney Houston, because she is not living. Bobby Brown, because he is not female. Jay-Z, for various reasons. So let's talk a little bit about compression. So if you have an array like this dense array that is about 50% on, and that's, that's all this is, each bit has about a 50% chance of being on or off, um, we can't compress this array any further. It is as compressed as it can get because it's essentially random. If we're talking about a sparse array, like one with 4% on, then we always know there's only going to be, at most, four bits within this representation that are going to be on at any time. So we can compress this quite a bit. All we need to store are the indices of those on bits. So if we grab those four indices of those bits, we can store just those four numbers. And since we know that we can store an integer up to 256 in an 8-bit array, that means we can store this in 32 bits. So of all those 175 million possible values that we could fit into a sparse representation of 256 bits, each of them could be stored in a 32-bit array. So we know that we can compress sparse representations in bit arrays very uh, efficiently. And now I've given you an example of what a sparse array looks like versus a dense array and some basic binary operations. We're going to talk a lot more about sparse arrays as when we talk about sparse distributed representations in the upcoming episodes. So I hope you enjoyed this short intro into binary and bit arrays and binary operations. I hope you'll follow up and watch the next episodes. Hit like and subscribe if you want to keep watching. And thanks for watching HTM School episode one.